Boom, what's going on guys? Welcome to another episode of the Concord Health Podcast and today's guest, uh, I'm super excited to have today's guest on. We've got British champion or I think you were 2018 British champion, is that right Bobby? 2018 and 19, yeah. Oh both, okay. 2018-19 British champion Bobby Butters on today um, and we're going to talk and get some nuggets for you guys and girls out there that are looking to lift some weight basically and uh we're going to inspire you big time today. So I feel like I'm starting this conversation the same way every time at the moment, but I know we had an informal chat offline. How is lockdown? It's the question. (laughs) It's like the question. Everyone's asking. It's like, dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Um, You know, we go to someone, oh, what are you up to this weekend? That's like a dead question now. I know, you're like, um... (laughs) So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm on the couch. I'm, tr- I'm I'm pumping weights and then nothing. But yeah, this is how's lockdown for you? How is it work wise and training wise and just mentally as well? For some people, it's been fine and great, um, but yeah. some people find it mentally quite hard. So, have you been with the whole thing? Um, so as I mentioned to you, as as you say offline, I feel I'm in a very fortunate situation. Um, so I've I've not found it um a bad experience necessarily. Um, I did unfortunately um, lose both of my jobs that I had previously. Um, I am furloughed though, which again is super, super beneficial. Both my jobs are zero contracts, so I had no idea if I was going to have any form of income. Um, so it's not much, but it's, you know, it's something that I'm very grateful for. Um, and those jobs are supply teaching. I've been doing that for a very short period of time. So obviously schools are being closed and stuff. Sure. Um, so a lot of my attention has gone more towards, uh, initially finishing my masters, which I finished in April. Uh, so that was cool. I handed in my final thesis and just towards my coaching career and what, what it is I actually want to do with my career as a whole, uh, which is a really big question. And I'm at, I'm at a crossroads right now. So I'm very grateful for the extra time I've got to think, which for the past five years in particular, I don't feel like I've had that kind of quiet time, so to speak. It's always been prepping for competition, working two to three jobs, and studying. So it's like, yeah, you're, kind of calm down a bit. You're, you're a type A, right? You're a type A personality. You're bouncing around from thing to thing on the go. You wanna, you always want to achieve things. And actually, I, I say this to a few people, I do a lot of um, life coaching with athletes, but also normal people that, that have some more complex issues. And I've said to a lot of people who have said to me, I feel so depressed, I can't wait for life to get back to normal. I said, well, there is no normal. This is the new normal. And actually, take a step back and this time is a gift. You know, one thing we can't ever get back is time. And to be gifted with some extra time, as long as you're healthy and as long as your loved ones are healthy, um, you know, you're financially stable enough to get by, it's, it's such a gift to expand our mind, to step back and say, oh, actually, now I've got some time to think about what I really want in life. What do I really want to achieve? You know, can I put more time into training? Do I need to sit back and, and look at the direction my life was going? And, and actually, I've personally found it a really empowering experience. I, I haven't found it, you know, depressing in the slightest. But it's, it's actually trying to make people see that. And, you know, for you, like what you're saying, if you're bouncing around constantly, doing a master's is, is, is hard and it's really time consuming and you're competing at the top, 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 top level of sport and competition, you know, you're combining two really difficult things together and then trying to do, you know, amazingly at both of them. That, that's quite difficult. So I guess for, you know, I'm presuming for someone like you to be able to step back from your day to day slightly, it's been a bit of a breath of fresh air. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's as it's 100% um, got me thinking about where my life was and where I wanted to go, where it was going and stuff. So yeah, I have definitely found the, the positives in what is a very unprecedented, yeah. obviously, on the whole, quite a difficult situation. It, it is, it is difficult for a lot of people. But I mean, and, and ultimately, difficult situations for tougher people and we've all just got to get through it together as a unit because you know the human race has been faced with a lot of hard situations previously 
viruses, wars, all sorts of crazy things, and we're still here. And, you know, it's got to be the strong people that, that can support as many people as possible that drag, that drag us through this whole situation. So you're, you, you're a TA, you said, right? Are you, is that something, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this question. Are you going to be going back to it in September? Are, are you going to be allowed to go back? You said you've been furloughed. Have they given you an indication that you can go back? They haven't as of yet. All they've done at the minute is they've just asked, um, are you available in September? And I've been honest and I've said, I'm not sure at the minute. Yes, that is my current plan to purely from a financial perspective. Um, I was like, yes. So potentially September, but ultimately I have no idea. That's cool. Run, ride the wave, ride the wave. See where it takes yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> whatever it is that you... Um, that you're going to do, you'll do well at, so you'll find your feet, whatever. <laughs> so um, your master's, it was in sports, remind me? What um, so my, my master's actually um, a master's by research. Oh, so okay. I did my undergrad in strength and conditioning, That's and then I did a master's by research, which ultimately was, it was actually an extension of my dissertation, to be honest, in the end. Well, that was my initial kind of thoughts. Um, so it was basically for two years, a research, well, two and a half years ended up being uh, a research project. Um, so working on that same piece of work for that amount of time. Okay. Yeah, that, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is that, always, is that always something you wanted to do? Um, uh, it's in strength and conditioning or? Yeah, so is it, yeah is in, as, as your undergrad, the strength and conditioning and sports always something you want to do because I, I I've listened I listened to a previous po a previous podcast of yours and you said that you always wanted to be a personal trainer and you always wanted to go that kind of route yeah. and has has do you feel that you knew that you wanted to do that at university that particular course or is that something that evolved that of wanted to be in the fitness industry and the latter more so yes yeah. so I never knew I wanted to go to uni until I passed as a PT when I was seventeen. Um, I always knew I wanted to be a personal trainer right from when I was very, very young. I'm talking seven, eight years old at primary school. You know, you talk about what you want to do when you grow up. But that was always where I wanted to be. I wanted to help people achieve their goals. And I knew a way of doing that at the time as a personal trainer. Um, and then when I, I remember, because you have to do like, obviously your exams, portfolio and stuff like that. I remember the last exam I did was like the basic like nutrition exam. I remember finishing that and I was I'd not long turned 17 and I was like my my life's dream I've achieved that and I'm 17 and I've realized just how much you can learn in this industry and I was like I want to carry on and I want to go to uni um so then after that I then did a sports science extended diploma at college which gave me the UCAS points to then go to uni yeah okay okay interesting so you're you are definitely one of those athletes that lives and breathes it. It's in terms of your work life or your study life. You know, we have quite a lot of, I hear a lot of powerlifters, you know, they, they go to the gym, they powerlift, and that is their sports life, but they completely separate it. They've got two completely different worlds. You know, I, I think you've got someone like Taylor Atwood, who's like a financial analyst, analyst or yeah. I don't believe someone like Tony Cliff. I don't think he's in the industry. Like there's loads. I mean, I'm just picking yeah. up that hat there. Um, but you, you kind of live and breathe the whole thing. And so I mean, where, did, where did it start? Where did your lifting journey start? My lifting journey started um, when I was 16 and I uh, was at college learning how to do the compound lifts correctly. That's ultimately where my athletic career started. I've always enjoyed lifting weights from when I was a very, very young girl. Um, I had my own set of weights in my bedroom at like age 10, 11. Um, the old Argos screw on weights. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, and when I was like three years old, my mum and dad had a multi gym in the garage, and I used to like just go and play on it. Like, I had no idea what it was, obviously, at that time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I've always, always been into lifting stuff, but my actual lifting career didn't officially start till I was 16, and then that's when I started competing and stuff. Okay, so before that, were you were you into sports? Did you used to do a lot of team sports? I did, yeah, when I was at school, yeah. Um, I wasn't exactly technically skilled. I was the fast one. Um, 
the fast one and the strong one I was always labeled as that so I used to be put on positions that could just like be the heavy <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so shot for 100 meter sprint that kind of thing oh yeah you know that those are like my main ones uh, athletics um unfortunately our school didn't have rugby um but we had hockey um that was my main sport when I was at school hockey I used to do sprinting all the time when I was at school but yeah yeah, how, how do you find the difference between doing a team sport compared to an individual sport? Because I know that I, I've done team sports for the most part until I crossed over to boxing. So that was at 20, well, I started boxing when I was 17, but started competing heavily when I was 18. And actually, I always used to think that I love team sport and used to love the camaraderie and everything about it. And actually, it was almost like one after one, there was one particular year I thought, this just isn't for me anymore. I'm so sick of having to worry about a coach, about certain training facilities that I can't control, about whether my teammates are going to perform or not. And it, there was just a point in time where I thought, stuff it. Unless I'm just playing for a little bit of fun with some friends, I'm not going back to team sport. Like, I'm so done with it. And it's really refreshing that um, now powerlifting or when it's to box, whatever, it's, it's I know that I can just con control my performance and it's just me that's got to turn up and I can do all the, the five percent around it with my food and with my equipment and whatever that might be. How did you find that, you know, did you enjoy team sport before or what do you find a big difference or a preference? I definitely, I think I've always preferred the individual sport. However, Obviously, unlike yourself, I, I just did it at school. I didn't do it as like a profession. I only ever did it in school. Um, so it wasn't like, you know, in, in professional football where you properly get like a team feel and stuff like one week you might be playing with some people, next week you'll be playing with completely different people. It was very much more like a hobby when I was actually at school. Um, and then when I left school, it was just at college and you're just like, you're doing some coaching sessions and stuff like that. And I immediately drew towards being more an individual um, a person, and doing an individual sport. Yeah. Um, so that was me naturally. I think I enjoyed sport, um, but I've definitely, like I enjoyed the sprinting and the shot put a lot more than I did the hockey season, round this season and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and the, the thing is, the funny you say that they're individual sports, though, really, right? So it, yeah. it's basically the same concept. That's obviously what you're, you're geared towards uh, genetically and almost psychologically. That, that's where yeah. you're, you're in your zone. So you started lifting at 16 in college. Now, was it ever something you'd ever considered before or you knew about? Or was it just like, you okay, you're just doing a course or you're doing a course in college, you're learning how to lift. and you th Was it immediate? Oh, I actually love this. How did it go about, you know, getting to your first competition from there? Okay, so um, I've got a very uh, big person, I guess, to thank for this because I had no idea what powerlifting was, never heard of it before. But basically, there's this guy called Martin Beastle. Okay. And he was a tutor at the college that I was at. Um, and he basically came up to me after I was basically in, a, in the gym practicing with the lads how to deadlift. Never done it before. They asked me how much I could lift. I was like, I don't know. Never done it before. Like, meh. <laughs> have you, and, uh, have you been attempted a deadlift ever before this? No, I just like used to mess around in my room. I used to make stuff up. God knows what I used to do in my bedroom. Um, like, just do all sorts. So yeah, um, and I deadlifted 100 kilos. Really? At that time, I, I didn't know what that meant at all. Like, obviously, you know, we were just like messing around. Like, I actually have a picture of my first ever deadlift of 100 kilos. Oh, that's friggin' awesome. That, that's that's it. Framed it, <laughs> it, it's framed in my mom and dad's living room. Awesome. And say, so I'm there with my like um, running trainers on, you know, not knowing what that what the awful form <laughs> Embar embarrassing the show. It wasn't even like 20 kilo heights either, it was all 10 kilo plates. So it was like a deficit, I guess. Um, I would say quite a big deficit. <laughs> well, yeah, obviously, again, I had no idea what was going on. And basically, after that session, um, this Martin Vista came up to me and said, have you ever heard of powerlifting? I was like, no. Went, went home, um, kind of Googled it. What, what is this about? That same day, I think, I entered a competition. Two months later, I competed in said competition. Um, really? So uh, hey, after that one day, you just decided, stuff it, I'm going to enter, that's it. Yeah, I was just like, wow, let's give it a go. 
So do you have any, do you, have, do you have any experience with a squat or a bench at all? Anything? No, not really. really. Other than just what, as I say, what I messed around with. Um, so yeah, I had I had no real real experience. I was just like, well, let's just give it a go. That's um, interesting. I've, so so you started, you were training, so you had two months to prepare or always prepare as best as you thought you could. So so what happened from there? Did you have a coach or you just started, you were cracking on doing some bench and squat? Yeah, but I just was, was cracking on. I just couldn't believe that this thing that I enjoyed doing, lifting lifting metal essentially through yeah. space. Oh, this is a sport. Right. Well let's let's see what happens. It's so freaking awesome, isn't it? And that that, what, that 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 is the way to that's the way to do it, is to throw yourself in the deep end actually and learn on the job. Because look yeah. at where you are now. But you know how, we don't see these people, but there's thousands of people out there who spend years and years Ask, you know, saying when I or when, you know, like when they they're waiting for some sort of perfect. I know, I know. I'll, I'll compete when I'm strong enough. What? When are you strong enough, people? Yeah. <laughs> when when I'm, you know, when I get this fit, then I'll get a PT or whatever it is. It's oh like, yeah, heard that, heard that many times. Whoever is listening or whoever's going to listen to this when I send this live, take bloody action now. At this yeah. point, as we're saying this, at this point in the podcast, whatever it is you want to do, take action. So that is my quick rant. Over. <laughs> <laughs> Life is about action. So what you've done there, that's so freaking awesome that you just like, you're not, you weren't even worried about, well, you probably, it probably crossed your mind these little things like, oh, will I do well? Or it always does, right? Your first competition. Will I, am I good enough? Will I fall over? All these. I was, I was nervous as hell. I, yeah. I nearly, I nearly pulled out. I was that nervous, but I was like, well, it's not going to happen. I've never pulled out of anything. Yeah. But I remember being like, oh, what would happen if I just pulled out? And I was like, I'm just going to go and do it. I was so nervous though. Ridiculously nervous, but I still get nervous now. So that's just in my personality. So. Yeah. People don't realize that actually. So, you know, when, when they watch a big event, they think the athletes are just, you know, they've just walked onto whatever stage <laughs> and that's it. They perform. Well, I tell you before my first boxing bout, I threw up about eight times in the toilet. I was so nervous. Oh, bless you. And it was, well, it's good because looking back on it now, I took it seriously. That it meant something to me, and, and the whole journey, and my first powerlifting comp, I was I was nervous, not quite as nervous because I had some experience. Yeah, yeah. It, it, of, of competing on a singular stage, but but it's important for people to realise, you know, if there's any guys or girls listening to this um, that aren't sure, you know, does a top competitor like you get nervous, and you admit, and you do, but you're able to to harness those nerves and make them work for you, um, obviously, because, you know, you wouldn't be where you are at the moment. So you've done your first comp. How did it go? I thought it was brilliant. I, I, thought, I thought it was it was fantastic. It was only a push-pull comp in this spitting sawdust gym in the back streets of Dudley. It was epic. I, I was able to walk there. Didn't even have to, like, drive. I walked there by myself. I was like, right, let's get cracking. Um, oh, cool. And did you did you place or what was it was it was it? Um, I think I won, and got female best lifter. Oh, okay. If I remember, I think. <laughs> oh, top my head. I I remember. Though obviously this was years ago. You know, there wasn't a huge amount of females there, but there was a few. So there was, and I was very young as well. And there, so there wasn't very many young people. And I was a BDFPA. So the way their categories worked, I probably was the only person in my category. Because I was super light, super young, um, and there wasn't a huge amount. There was a lot of females, but like compared to compared to competitions now, there wasn't as many. Um, well, it's, it's, so it's I, massively growing with the females, right? I mean, I I, I competed in February an S uh, an SW comp, and there was more females than males actually. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. surprise me at all. Yeah which, yeah, which is which is great. Like, I mean, it's amazing. I'm all for it. I think um, it's really empowering actually for. For, for this whole movement of strong women as opposed to, you know, like like skinny skinny and starving yourself kind of stuff that it was 10 years ago maybe or whatever. Um, a lot more women are realising the benefits of lifting weights now. And, you know, it doesn't mean necessarily have to compete in something, but weight training is so important. So I, I really like to see that, actually. I think it's healthy. Um, so you've done your first comp. Then when, was that it? Were you bitten? Was that the bug? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I qualified for the nationals, so then that's what I did. 
Um, and then yeah, junior nationals. Junior nationals, yeah, would be the FPA. Yeah. Oh, I think that was in like Stafford or something like that back in 2012, I think. Yeah, something like that. I remember um, uh, going to there, and I actually did Olympic weightlifting as well. Um, so after I did that nationals. I don't remember the exact sort of timelines. I then did a few more local meets and I then I qualified for a uh, for the the world championships WDFPA or PF or something like that. World Drug Free Powerlifting Federation, I think it's called. Yeah. Um and after I qualified for that, I actually whilst I was doing the prep for that competition, I started doing Olympic weightlifting as well. So I was like a bit of a hybrid for a little while. Then after I did that that, that championships I then went fully into Olympic weightlifting for oh, about a year and a half to two years what um, made you do that that's interesting I it was a really cool sport I remember watching it at the Olympics obviously in 2012 yeah. um I remember watching Rebecca Tyler obviously she was super young um at like she was on Rebecca Tyler I uh, was on the news I think and around that time uh and I thought she was fantastic she was like something silly like 14 snatching ridiculous amounts of weight and I found that amazing that she was doing that um and I basically just like I rang up British weightlifting and was like so I want to do British weightlifting I want to do Olympic weightlifting sorry where where could I go and they put me in contact with a local coach um and then that's kind of how that kind of spiraled um ultimately I wanted ultimately I was like I wonder if I could go to the Olympics that was my that was my thought process um yeah, I mean, yeah, so it should be. I mean, did you <laughs> did, did you compete? I did, yeah, yeah. Um, I did pretty well um, in Olympic weightlifting. It's, it's unfortunate that I had to stop it, but um, I got selected for the Olympic development squad, so I was almost on the road to trialling to go to 2016 Olympics. Okay. Um, so that was kind of that kind of career. I was, I think I won... Uh, uh, under 23 championships junior championships and i came second at the senior championships competing as a junior i was one kilo off gold i do remember that very vividly man you've got you've got a, you've got an awesome lifting career just for such a young person as well <laughs> so if you what made you stop you said unfortunately you had to stop was that was that choice did you prefer powerlifting or was it kind of um in the ultimately the reason why I went back to powerlifting is because I realized I did prefer it however I stopped because of chronic fatigue syndrome and a lot of pain in my back and hips and things um that's ultimately why I stopped so I basically I got selected for the Olympic development squad and what you have to do with that is you go down to camps and I was going down to these camps in Loughborough um and I'd gone to like three or four of them and they invited me to basically go to the six week camp and that was in my first year of uni as well so I was traveling uh, quite 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 a lot um with this and it was just before I was going to leave for the six week camp and I realized just how much pain I was in and I remember seeing an osteopath at the time um because I was in a lot of back pain and they told me loads of, they went through like biomechanical assessments and stuff but my back really wasn't in a good way it wasn't my pelvis wasn't in a good way it just wasn't moving well at all uh and I was as I say I was in a lot of pain chronic fatigue so I was like right I decided it's time to take a step back and 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 look after my body a bit now before it before it's too late and before it breaks that was my kind of thought process um it's, it's, it's good you had the foresight to do that because a lot of people don't. In fact, they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and something major goes wrong. I, I, you know, I can't, I can't even tell you the amount of times I've seen that, that, you know, and it's, yeah. if you, you know, th there's always a road back, but you could end up putting yourself out for long periods of time by just not yeah. listening to yourself. And fortunately you haven't, you didn't do that. Was you said you had chronic fatigue. Do you think that's just because you were literally tearing the ass out of it, like training X amount? Because and it, and it, I've never done Olympic weightlifting. You know, I know I had to snatch and, and whatnot, and I, I've done the training. I've, I've never competed, and I've got no interest, and I've done bits in the gym. I'm probably quite average at it, to be honest. Um, but from, 
from being a trainer and taking a step back, you need to do a lot of training to be an Olympic weightlifter, right? It's a lot of sessions. There's a lot of things going on. You need, you know, mobility, flexibility, all sorts of different kinds of, of strength in terms of the mechanics. Now, do yeah. you think that you've done that? Because obviously, I presume at that time you were at uni. Is that correct? Or um, So I had just moved to uni when I decided to stop. Okay. Um, so the time when I was, it was when I was at college doing my diploma, my extended diploma to go okay, to uni. Okay, so you were, you were grafting fairly hard. And then how many sessions were you doing as an Olympic weightlifter? I was doing sometimes six days a week, sometimes two sessions each day. Um, and obviously with Olympic weightlifting, they can be a bit longer. I was there for like four hours a day, like just drilling, drilling, drilling. I wasn't, because of like various things, I wasn't the most technically proficient lifter either. Um, like I was very much on if it was on a spectrum i was more towards the stronger more brute strength style of weightlifting yeah. whereas you've got others who are fast and very technically efficient yeah. um, i think if you were to pinpoint it there's obviously lots of variants and things like that but that's kind of what olympic weightlifting was so i was able to muscle through a lot of things yeah. um and because my body wasn't moving efficiently either i i, I was born with Lord, um, a lordotic spine basically and that same as me on the same yeah side. well it creates all sorts of issues if you don't sort of um move correctly my lumbo pelvic rhythm and my pelvic control was non-existent i have caught cleans in positions that really shouldn't be caught um <laughs> should just be left alone and not <laughs> um i remember the first time i ever cleaned 70 i don't know if you can imagine this but essentially i caught it in the squat position and both my knees collapsed inwards and my <sighs> And my knees and bum landed on the floor. And I still stood up with it. Yeah. How stubborn can you be to still stand up with it? Oh. I just remember my coach running over. Drop the weight, drop the weight. Oh, my God. So I, I mean, yeah. I know exactly what position you're talking about. My back's just started hurting. Oh, that is oh, I know. And my knees. <laughs> How my knees survived that, I'm really not sure. But that was quite a common occurrence as well. So, obviously, that can hamper your progress if you've got not a lot of control over where your body is in space and you've got to react dynamically with strength in very difficult challenging positions you know yeah there's only so far you can do that <laughs> yeah i mean and ultimately you're going to end up no matter how strong you are you're never ever going to reach a pinnacle and a yeah. top level because there's going to be someone else out there that is super strong as well but is technically proficient and yeah. I'm not, not saying that you couldn't, and, and you, I'm sure you would have corrected all those things, but, you know, if it was absolutely ruining you and burning you out, and yeah, there's probably a point where you're just walking in the gym and you're like, Ugh. Yeah, yeah, it got, it like, got to really? that point. Yeah. yeah. You're like, Ugh, I'm meant to enjoy this, and I kind of yeah. know what I do, but fuck, man. Like, we, we've all been there. Um, any top athlete has been there, you know. I, towards the end of my boxing career, I used to go in, sit in the changing room, hadn't even warmed up, and I just look at my feet for like half an hour, <laughs> thinking, oh, man, I need to put these boxing boots on, but I just, like I was training two to three times a day, six days a week, same thing, and alongside running four businesses, and I, it just got to a point where I think, I'm not going to be the, try to be the best at this on the planet, because that's always my mindset, try to be just go for it. Then I think, what's, what's the point? Like I've been doing it 11, 12 years. And you, you amazingly had the foresight early and crossed over to something else that you were, um, became, have become excellent at. So, I mean, I commend you for doing that actually, because a lot of people are, are stubborn. I mean, we're all stubborn. Every athlete's stubborn, but stubborn, stubborn can also lead you down the wrong path. Yeah. And it's a lot about being stubborn and, and kind of, um, linear thinking but in the right direction and not saying right I'm just you know I'm going to keep going until I get this right and you don't ever get it right so um, I, I do commend you for doing that so you 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 come back over to powerlifting let's down to the powerlifting now because that's what everyone really wants <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you come up back over to powerlifting and did it take a while to recover feel better oh yeah yeah took a long time Obviously, I, I actually I had a lot of issues to correct 
mentally and physically. I had a lot of things to work on. I was still in pain. Like when I decided to, to come back into powerlifting, I'd probably only been pain free in the last two years. Really? And what, what do you attribute to that? So t- talk us about your, your recovery, because I'm doing this a bit back to front, because I'm going to go through your competitions and your, uh, and, and your training methods and your programming. But since we're on it, talk us about your recovery. What, do you do to, to, what did you do to get healthy and what did you do to stay healthy? Um, so learning about what my body was actually doing um, was a big thing. I was very fortunate that obviously I started my degree in strength and conditioning. So I was constantly learning about the body and things and, and learning how the pelvis is supposed to move and, you know, how knee control is, is important and, and X, Y, Z, there was loads of things. I'd seen numerous physios and I went down the NHS physio route. It wasn't quite for me. Um, and then I'd say maybe three, three years ago, I think now, maybe even four. Um, I met this physio at the university and he was, it was a physio and sports therapist kind of like combined. And by this point I'd started competing again and it was all just a matter of a lot of corrective exercises. Um, and a lot of core strength was being built, gaining control of my pelvis and again, understanding it um and also mindset was a big thing as well something that i know kind of helped me towards um experiencing less pain was accepting that pain might always be there um and there's there's so there's copious amounts of instances i can go through but i don't want to bore your listeners with all of my all of my stories but like they're your your listeners right (laughs) (laughs) um but like i had competitions for example where i could only do my first deadlift just to make a total for a long time it wasn't until i went to europeans 2018 um where i actually was able to (laughs) lift more than one deadlift um so i was like right happy days you know it's and it's a and it's a very long process and it's about controlling what you can control if deadlifting makes your pain worse then then don't don't do things that make it worse actually take a step back i worked on things like correcting my hip hinge actually getting some hamstrings that was able to be active it doesn't mean that I had to completely come away from lifting, but it meant I had to do accessory movements and things that might not have been the compound movements, the competition lift, sorry, but it had a transfer and it had a, a place in my programming. Um, and the big thing in terms of the pain and the mindset was my, um, as I say, my uh, physio said to me, you might always have this back pain. And I can't tell you how powerful that was. And and you you will definitely resonate with this as well. As an athlete trying to be the best you can be, you're constantly teetering on that edge of maximal performance and injury niggles and things like that. Because you're pushing your body as much as you can. Um, so, you know, these things do crop up. And every athlete has these little niggles that crop up and you just have to know how to maintain them as best as you can. Yeah. And, and I also think um, you make some great points there, even for me to listen to. Um, Because to have that reinforced over and over is important. And and one thing you're saying, learning about those niggles and learning how to, you know, what you're kind of saying, learning how to work with them and maintain them and and know where your limitations are for that particular injury, not not with your lifting, but that particular injury and not, but also not actually trying to force yourself through those injuries so you saying you might be able to squat perfectly fine and really heavy and all the accessories for that might be great but certain things like certain deadlifts or certain accessories like you know i don't know if this does affect you but like a pendele row or something might not be even though it's a great accessory for a deadlift might not be effective for your back and ultimately yeah. you just need to get to the platform healthy enough because you know you can perform yeah so yeah absolutely yeah you know you're strong enough to give anyone hell on their day but you know you're not to to go there with injuries you're only doing yourself a disservice so yeah i get what you're saying completely there yeah do you do any more traditional recovery work so how's your your stretching do you sauna cryotherapy yoga anything along those lines i do every day i do stretching and foam rolling and things like that i do find that helps me personally um 
some people might disagree with that completely. Obviously, if you look at the research, you've got both sides of the coin. Um, so some people swear by it, other people think it's a load of rubbish, but I personally find it very, 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 very beneficial. A bit of manual therapy, obviously from my physio, we have corrective exercises. We've got, me and my physio have done all sorts of different things over the years. Um, but me personally, stretching and foam rolling every single morning without fail, um, going through just some general movements does help uh, a lot. And after training, I tend to do a bit of stretching um, as well um, once I've warmed up. And my actual warm-up for lifting, that's something that's progressed over the past five years, five, six years in particular. But I find my warm-up is very helpful for me as well. How, how long do you warm up? That, that's an interesting point. So how long do you warm up for pre, pre-session? So in, in an ideal world, not a rushed world. Yeah, yeah. So um, Fortunately, I have got it down to I can get warmed up now in like 15 minutes. Um, I used to, during the very extensive rehab process where my actual sessions weren't as long, so to speak, I guess part of my session was the warm up. I'd be like foam rolling everything. Whether that whether I did overkill, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, I was definitely at one point that person that had my hip hanging on a, a very st- stiff band, trying to pull it into position, which had its place. I think I may have overkilled it one or two times, but you know, um, so that kind of did help. And then it was to make sure though that that was then combined with exercise. So it's all very well kind of doing the stretch and getting loose and things like that, but actually then doing exercises to help that. Something as simple as a pelvic tilt took me a very long time to be able to do properly, um, especially being stood up. That was a big one for me. Being able to pelvic tilt with when I was stu- stood up was very difficult. Yeah. Um, so things like that, working on, like just little little goals, little percentiles. Yeah, well, um, that's it. Exactly. You took the words out of my mouth. I was about to say they're percentiles, right? Although there are half a percent that, that lead to, you know, a bigger, a bigger percentage somewhere on the platform. And when you hit that perfect day, all those things add up. They all add up massively. Of course they do, yeah. Um, okay, so you, you warm up. So your warm up's like 15 minutes, which is good. Is it more, is it more you know, I don't want to overkill this part of the combo, but is it more active? It's yeah, active it's much, much more active stuff. Yeah, it's about just getting myself warm, getting the heart rate up there, um, and just activating the muscles I know is beneficial for myself. Well, what would you say if you had to give anyone out there, and this is, um, this is quite a broad question because everyone's very different. If you had to pick one warm-up exercise for a powerlifter, have you got... Well, have you got one for you that you will not never miss? One particular exercise that you always have to do as part of your warm up. I'm putting you on oh the my spot, gosh. Here, Bobby. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so I me, must admit. For example, I always have to warm up with some form of loaded floor bridge. Like for me, it just works for me. I found it helps with my, my power. Personally, I don't know why. It helps with my deadlift lockout and my power out the hole on my, my deadlift. I also have a big bubble butt as I can call it so a big little dotted curve so like I need to do quite a lot of variations of some bridges and I like to get a plate and, and a bar and even do some lighter loaded bridges to warm up so that will be my yeah. I do that yeah that's probably my it's my first go-to when I start moving I put a band around my knees I do some pelvic tilts with the band and then I do some bridges myself okay. I'd say um, this is quite a difficult one because not everyone can do this greatly, but some form of lunge is very helpful because you've got a lot of joints moving around. You've got activation and active stretching. But obviously, uh, if you've never done a lunge before and you're unstable, then maybe not. Then maybe something a bit different. But a lunge can be very helpful if you're able to do that. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I really agree. And actually the same part of this conversation crosses over to accessories, actually. Uh, for, so getting your accessories right and right for your body as well. And having, I find, and I've played around, I mean, I've actually not been powered in that long, but I've, I've found that over the last 18 months since I've kind of come back from the heart issue that we spoke about, that, you know, I was doing a lot of things like, leg extensions and hamstring curls. And actually for me personally, it does F all. Like it does, actually doesn't work for me. I know it does for some people, but 
I've had huge gains in my squat in the last six weeks by doing some really heavy loaded barbell split squats and lunges actually. So it's the same sort of thing, having go-tos that you realize that just work for you. Like you said, you've had a lot of back issues, so you're going to have warm-up exercises and accessories that work for you. And, you know, this might be a problem with powerlifters when they start plucking programs off the internet. And that's fine for beginners. That's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you're, you're going to be doing yourself a disservice as a powerlifter if you're not. It's a really strange sport. You need to be able to recognize things that are working for you and things that aren't over periods of time so maybe like someone would review it in every 12 week blocks or eight weeks or whatever you know someone's doing but you know if after 12 weeks you like, mm, haven't really kind of got the sort of progression i thought i might get why is that is it your accessories do you need to look at things that do you need to start chopping and changing things up and working with a good coach um, or just being able to recognize those things yourself. I mean, I'm sure you have accessories that you know that work for you much better than other things. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so important that. Um, we're going to talk about that in your programming. In <laughs> so I want to know all about your programming. So, oh, my gosh. <laughs> British. So you two, uh, two-time British champ, 2018, 2019? I actually, it's come think of it, I think I'm three. I think I won two juniors and I've got one senior under my belt. Okay, so two, two juniors, one senior. Yeah. God, you won so many, you can't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> time, it's because time just goes so quickly. And obviously this year you blink and it's flipping nearly July, for God's sake. Uh, oh, no, so <laughs> I know. Right, let's talk about your senior one. So okay. how did that feel? How did that feel winning the first British seniors? Because you're, you're really vocal on the platform, right? A lot of screaming, a lot of gearing up. Love it. That's, well, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like the <laughs> I love it, man. I think uh, sometimes in the IPF, there's not enough of that. It's, it's wicked to see some emotion on the, um, on the platform. But you're, I mean, you're, you're an emotional-ish, or emotional, maybe not the right word, but a psyched up lifter. Yeah, sure. that's, a, that's a very, very good word to describe me. In general, emotional. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Yeah. You yeah, summed me up very nicely there. <laughs> we stay with emotion. emotion. Emotion's good when you harness it. So, I mean, and listen, how did that feel, winning your first British? Because that's a, you're a national champion. It's an amazing achievement. What? Oh, yeah, it's incredible. Uh, I cried a lot. Every time I won, I've cried. Um, every time I get a PB, I cry. So, you know, <laughs> um, but no, yeah, it feels, it feels awesome. It does, it feels awesome. It was really great because um, my first senior was the, my first competition as a 57. Um, so that was really cool. And obviously, I knew I wanted to go to Worlds uh, and Europeans. And that was the competition um, that I knew if I was in a position, finally, if I got invited to Worlds, I could say yes. Um, so I've been invited to three worlds previously and I've had to say no. Um, oh, damn, I didn't realise. Okay, I, I know you've, yeah. done, you've done one world, right? Is that yeah. one, one world? One world, one Europeans, yeah. And that was last year? Last year, yeah. Yeah, last year. So I knew you'd done one world. I didn't realise you'd been invited three times and turning that. And is that because of work commitments or injuries or? Um, too financial because um, it's just being a student you know it's like it's just really difficult um so yeah uh financial reasons and one of them was injury um basically it was when i was first started working with my physio and that we think that i'd pulled my glutes in the squad meet actually leading up to uh being invited to the world uh. because i deadlifted a misloaded bar and i felt something go straight away and i was like what the hell is going on here um and i was, we wasn't sure what it was and i was continuing to train on it but it was really starting to aggravate aggravate me um and me and my physio were like right if we continue and not address this this could only get worse and impact other areas so i was like for a lot i'm all about longevity in sport i really am and i was like right i'd rather take the time get this correct and then not be in pain uh, and yeah. i was it was the right decision i, I knew it was um so yeah that's that, that, that's key what you say right longevity because powerlifting in particular is not real 
couldn't compete till any age of powerlifting. Yeah, exactly. Look at Jem Thompson, for goodness sake. She's like, what, 45? Yeah, yeah. Kimberly, what, Kimberly Walford, she's also, I think she's 41, 42. Marissa um, Inder. Marissa Inder, of course. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, she's also, she's in her 40s, isn't she? Yeah, I think she's like 44, something. she looks about 30, but yeah. Yeah, I know. None of these women look their age um, at all. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and what's his name? Um, uh, Ricks, David Ricks. In, oh, yeah. Man, he's like, I think David Ricks is like, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to do him a disservice here, but I want to say like mid fifties. Yeah, He's yeah. Absolutely ridiculous numbers. I'm like seriously, and he was competing in the opens up until maybe a couple of years ago. So, yeah. you know, it's something that you, even if you, someone still isn't in the open, you can just, you know, F one, F two, F three, F four. You can just crack on and keep going. Oh, yeah. Actually, I know for a fact because of where the sport is now, you're gonna find several in in many years to come or in the next few years you're going to find several record breakers and champions in their 40s because i of, agree yeah yeah they're starting now so some so let's say let's take someone whoever like i, I don't know, let's take taylor atwood right so he's 33 or 34 something around that age if he decides that he just wants to keep going he doesn't get injured and he just you know stays healthy whatever why can't he continue to smash people up and, and, and break records in his 40s? Because you don't all of a sudden, the client just doesn't work like that. Not with strength. No. You know, no. you see some strength athletes and they actually, it's weird. You're like, damn, they seem to be getting stronger in their late 40s, not weaker. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you can keep going. So longevity is, is key, actually. Yeah. So yeah. sorry, I, don't, I digress there. You were saying about your, your, um, your invites to Worlds. So you finally listen. You finally got to Worlds last year. You done Euros first, right? Europeans was first. I did. Yeah, I did Euros first. Yeah. So talk, how was the call up? I mean, to get called up to Team GB, that must have been amazing. Oh, it was. It was incredible. I was so excited um, to, to and so honoured to finally represent my country. Something I've wanted to do since my Olympic lifting days. You know, and so yeah, it was. It was incredible to be to be selected. Have you got um? Have you got a little eye on the World Games? Is it twenty twenty two? Um, hopefully, yeah, yeah, definitely. We'll just see where see where it takes me. That's that's it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you got um, I think they're in Birmingham, Alabama. I was looking. Is it is it is it the World Games? What's the um, what's the one that's um? I think it's the World Games. You know, if if you're not in the Olympics, it's the next sports. I think it is the World Games. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so that's in twenty twenty two. That that would be an awesome awesome um, thing to go to 100 percent. so you've, yeah, got, sure. you've done the world you came third i did yes yeah i did amazing achievement and um did, so you you came third did you what about your free lifts did you did you medal in the free lifts as well i medaled in my squat i got a third in my squat yeah a third in your squat. so you i saw you squat now if i'm not i might be I think I'm correct in saying the world record at your at the 50 70 is 178. Is that right? Is that that's correct? correct. Yeah. You yeah. scored a double for 175 the other day. I did. Ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I did. He's <laughs> cooking. He's cooking. <laughs> yeah, bust out that monster squat at, at some point. We obviously we don't know when we can compete at the moment, but no. I I was meant to be at Worlds like three weeks ago in Belarus this year no, uh, yeah yeah who knows who knows what's going to happen in the future stay healthy bobby and this is you're obviously uh you're obviously cooking up something big so you went you went to worlds you came third that obviously must have been were you more nervous than normal do you think i, pr I get pretty nervous at local meets i was just my normal nerves <laughs> if i got if i got any more nervous i'd just be a withering wreck <laughs> <laughs> and what would what's a what's a difference competing on the international stage in terms of everything in terms of the the whole experience the set up the organization do you i mean there's obviously a huge difference but how how do you find it in your experience so my experience just kind of experience in the whole week I loved being part of like that powerlifting bubble that you're in for a whole week. And you go in, you go into this huge arena um, and you're seeing world famous powerlifters and you're just seeing so many people putting their heart and soul onto that platform. 
and it's incredible. The whole week is amazing. Uh, well, however long you're out there for, I was out there for a week. I was very fortunate to be in Sweden for a week, yeah. um, which was awesome. You're constantly meeting new people, and it's amazing. I actually loved it. I thought the organization was world class. It was fantastic. The people at um, in Helsingborg in the arena that we were at were fantastic. The staff were great. Um, I remember walking into the warm up room, and on Instagram, you'd seen people like videoing it and stuff. And I was like, I walked in, I was like, this is insane. This is professional on a whole new level. Yeah. Um, like warming up on your own platform, like, what? I've made it. <laughs> this is awesome. Um, but yeah, like that, that was insane. It really was. It and was, you find, um, um, is there anyone in particular that, or just in general, did you find people quite friendly, other athletes, other coaches, quite helpful? Because I, I you know, I've got some experience on the international scene, boxing, and, and actually very different. Um, for the most part, it's, it's a very different mentality in the sport and people aren't so friendly i find especially pre-competition but how, how do you find it on the international scene as a power lifter um so i'm kind of one of those people that's not very sociable when i am gonna go and compete um i prefer to not really interact with too many people i'm very focused on where i need to be what i need to do and how i need to do it that doesn't mean I'm rude to people at the same time. And people are really, really friendly. Yeah. And, you know, when you wait into weigh in and stuff and, you know, you can talk to others and, and things like that. And I've only had positive experiences from, from everyone from all over the world, their coaches, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, I can't, I can't think of a single negative experience I've had personally with other people. Why would there be really? I mean, amazing. Um, so you, who, so gold, the, the gold medal winner was, uh, what's her name? I can't pronounce Maria, it. Maria Hetty. Hetty, okay. So yeah. I'm not he, Hetty. He, he. No, I'll, so, I'll you, if there's a name, I'm butchering it. So. Oh, it's, me too. We're, it's, we're fine. We'll get through this together. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I need some support here for sure. <laughs> so she, now I, in my mind, I was, you know, I, I watched that. I watched the world and she, in my mind, she was like a huge squatter and a huge, she had some huge lifts. But actually looking back on it, like your, your squat is like, I think you squatted more than her, I want to say. I don't think, no, that's, I don't think that's or, true. Or, um, but right, she, uh, she, she holds the world record of 178. Oh, okay. So she holds, okay. So hang on. I've, actually, I've got it up here. So she squatted 172 and a half on the day. And you squatted 172 and a half. So I was almost, I was almost there on the day. So in my mind, like she's friggin' strong, but you're you're right up there. You're right up behind her. So goals wise, where are you at? What like in the next short term, midterm, long term, what what do you want to achieve in powerlifting? I mean, it might be hard to answer and you might not want to give away all those things. I guess. <laughs> but, I mean, where, where do you where do you want to see yourself at? What do you want so, to achieve? I would be extremely happy, and I'd feel like very successful if I long term goals. If I got to the end of my career and I can say I have done the absolute best I can possibly do, and I've got the most out of myself on every occasion, and I've done my best. To me. That means more to me than, than any medal, than any record, than any championship title, etc. That means the most to me. Yeah. Um, in terms of general goals, of course, being world champion is up there. I want to lift those weights. I want to get world records. Um, and I want, to, I want to be the best. I want to be the best in my weight category. Yeah. And I like to aim high. If I got female best lifter, that would be insane. I've got some heavy ass competition with that, but you know, like I, I'm all for aiming high and seeing what I can do. If my best gets me there, amazing. Yeah, and uh, that, that again, a great mindset. Someone, a coach said something to me once and it's always stuck with me. And that he said to me, stop thinking yourself as yourself or stop thinking as time ahead of you. So you're a young man and you're gonna be a young man for a long time, you know, even when you're in your 40s, you'll still see yourself that way as an athlete. But 
you have to think of yourself as, as time is behind you. You have to consider yourself and close your eyes and think of yourself as an 80 year old man who cannot do it anymore. And then think about the regret of not having given your all and not having really committed and done your best. And he said, if you ever want to see something to fear, he goes, go and talk to an old person and look into their eyes and let them tell you if only and what if and I should have done and if I had your time again. And that like changed my life completely. I thought, geez, man, he's so right. So we think of time is always ahead of us. I think, ah, oh, you know, I mean, I personally don't do this and I've ne never really done this, thankfully, but and I know people that do, and you know, they say, oh, you know, next year or next month, and, you know, like, fuck it, do it now and give it your all now and commit because all the nights out boozing and like smoking and partying with your friends, they essentially amount to fuck all. They amount to nothing. But at some point being a world champion or having just given every little lance, last ounce of blood, sweat and tears at whatever it is you're doing, is going to make your soul feel very, very peaceful compared to um, having given it up for just instant gratification. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, like you're saying, as long as you, I think, you know, deep down, you all know what your best, it, what, what would happen if you gave your best. I think you know that deep down and you know that it's something pretty, pretty big. But like you're saying, you, I think, you know yourself, if you give your best and, fruit and, and um, are fully committed and, yeah, like give it your all, like I just said, you, you will get the rewards and the medals and trophies and accolades that you should be getting, basically. And I think you know that, you know, considering what you've achieved already. So I think you're, you're saying the right thing there, really. Just, just give it your all. That's, that's all you can ever do. You can only ever do your best. Um, this is this is something that stuck with me for a very long time. I remember when I was 16 going to get my GCSE results from school and I remember having an epiphany whilst I was walking to school and I was so nervous that I'd failed my GCSEs and I was like I really wanted an A in English and all this anyway and I just remember saying to myself you know you studied your absolute best you know that those exams, you put your all into them. So whatever the result is, that is the result of your best. And that's all you can ask for. And that has stuck with me since I was 16, really strongly since I was 16. And I've carried it. I've tried to carry it as much as possible into every area of my life. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, it's so true. I mean, if you, it, it would save kids a lot, of, uh, a lot of mental health issues if they just, you know, when they were kind of pick up exam results, just to say, fuck, I was like, done your best stop worrying about it all the worrying yeah. you do is not going to change anything exactly six eight weeks until you get your results make yourself sick and then you get the result well, what difference does it make so just exactly exactly. And exactly people need to take that mantra into life stop stressing about everything for sure the difference is if you if you can honestly tell yourself you've done your best yeah. if you're regretting not working hard enough that's something different that you've got to live with yeah. Um, obviously you can't change it at all but yeah. that's why I think it is always important to actually to try your best if it's something you want to do well in then, then then try your best that's all you can do and you can't try any more than your best yeah yeah okay you, you, I mean you're so right I mean your best <laughs> what can I say what can I say I can't say anything else I'm moving on but it's so true I mean just, just give your best and don't stress basically guys it's, it's so important that so, talking about giving your best, my social media was blowing up earlier this year. You and Joy had one hell of a frigging battle at the British. Yes, we did. Yes, was we did. that, I mean, talk to me about that. How did that go down? That Because that was so tight, man. You were, I was tight. You were, you were leading into the deadlift, right? I was by 31 kilos. So crazy, man. Like, I know. I mean, I was, we were watching it, but I mean, it's quite... I was watching it on and off and I was doing things on that day. And I remember thinking, Dan, you've got that 31 kilo advantage. I didn't think that for a second. I did not think for a second that I had that. Yeah, I, I, mean, in, I, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, it's probably so different when you're, you're in it and you're yeah, the I, I actually didn't know how much of a lead I was in either until the end of the day because I don't follow the leaderboard. I mean, Joy's got a ridiculous deadlift. 
Um, oh yeah. It's yeah. Like crazy, but I mean, so she's you. You were sixty three, and you, you used to be sixty three kilo, but you've stepped down now to fifty seven, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. is that a recent thing? She's come up from fifty two to fifty seven. No, I think she's um, kind of crossed between the two quite a while. She's done. I, I, I could be wrong here, but I think she's done world as a 57. I'm not sure if that's correct. I'm not sure. But I know that she has done some competitions as a 57. For example, Europeans 2018, we both competed as a 57. Um, so I'm not sure because she was due to do Sheffield. I'm not sure if she was waiting to do a weight cut for Sheffield because that was only three weeks prior to the Nationals. Yeah. So I'm not sure what her, what her like game plan was or anything like that. Um, but I know she has battled between the two before. It's, um, I mean, there's, there's obviously really stiff competition between you two, but that's, I mean, from the outside looking in, that's going to make you and her, but you, because we're talking to you, a much better athlete. Having that level of, oh, yeah. of someone that you know is going to really push you. And even on your best day, you two are like, like that, it's going to, you know, I don't know if you're into football, but it's like that Ronaldo and Messi thing, you know, like they go back and forth and yeah, it's, um, that can only really be a good thing for you is just to, to say, okay, I've got someone here that is like, not my kryptonite, but my competition. And, and I, I, I will continue to graft my ass off in the gym because I know that she's going to be doing the same thing. And it's, uh, it's only going to push you to be a, a much stronger athlete for sure. I mean, do you two... Are you two, do you know each other well, you two? Do you, are you quite close? Or? Um, I do know it. Like, we get on really well. She lives in London. So, she, you know, she's, I think it's London. She lives obviously quite far from me. We're like, I think she's great. Obviously, as a, I think she's a lovely person. I get on with her really well. Um, so, yeah, like, I think she's, I think she's awesome. She's a world class athlete. She is one of the best in the world, yeah, in my massive. opinion. Yeah, um, it was so great that, to watch. I mean, it was, it was awesome to watch. I mean, had you gone and blitzed the field or she gone and blitzed the field, say you weren't there and, and one of you goes and just smashes it up and it's the same every year. You know, it's great, <laughs> but, but it's not great in terms of it's even better as a spectator. And sometimes I believe it's sweeter as an athlete if you're beating the best of the best. I agree. I completely agree. Yeah. And, and, and you basically, you know, you've got, we don't, you know, not every weight class in this country has the best of the best, but you basically got pretty much the best of the best to a degree in your weight class yeah. with her. So well, she's know. the she's the best in Britain, pound for pound. Yes. So she correct. is yeah. the she is the best of the best. Yeah. So you know that if you two go to Worlds, that you two are going to be right up there in Worlds. What? Oh yeah. Than, you know, like if some other weight classes. Um, great lifters, don't get me wrong, but they might then go to the worlds and be tenth. So it, it, it's it is a slightly different thing. You know that if you're tight to her and she's tight to you, that you're then both going to go to worlds and you're going to be right at the top in worlds as well because you know that's that's still that that kind of benchmark you two. What um, programming then? Talk to me. So who, do you do your own programming? Do you have someone do no, it? No, I have my my coach slash partner slash business partner. Uh, he's been. He's been doing my programming for nearly six years now. I've in known house. him for six years. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so, what, what kind of is there a particular method you do, or is that something you want to talk about? Um, I don't know if it's just the Ryan method. That's his name. Um, he's a very, very intelligent, very, very informed man. Um, he treats his athletes as individuals. Um, so there is no kind of sweeping method across everybody um obviously you've got general principles that are just for programming and periodization and xyz yeah. um and so yeah at the minute it's just all about trying to get stronger um i had an off season last year where we worked on different things and you know there's there's always something to be working on and developing and it'll just be dependent on the phase of training that i'm in and etc and you train four days a week five days normally Oh, five days, five days. Okay, yeah, yeah showing five days and and on your off days what do you what do you do on your off days you do any cardio in there um i do a lot of walking in general that's maybe the main cardio um i have done in various phases of training there is a bit more of explosive cardio so things like sprints 
Um, there was a video of me dying, attempting to do some tire flips last summer. Um, so yeah, that's, that's quite funny. It's quite funny to watch me do cardio because I've got exercise induced asthma. So like you just hear this, my breathing goes like this. <gasps> <gasps> like so I can't actually breathe. Um, and people That'd be find cool. panic attack for me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I need to record it. Every obviously when I when I do these sprints and things, I'm I'm doing it, so I can't record it. But oh, it'd be so funny to watch. How I must look hilarious trying to <laughs> get breath in. Um, so yeah, that does happen sometimes. <laughs> Five days a week, that that's, that's, must be quite tough on your body, but I guess you're, uh, um, it, I say this with respect, you're a smaller athlete, so it's, yeah. you, can cope with, you can probably cope with slightly more, whereas you wouldn't want someone like blooming Tony Cliff or someone, I mean, he can't, I've listened to him and he used to actually only train two days a week at one point, just the amount of, the weight he's shifting, there's just no way he could do that amount of, of volume. And um, what about things like nutrition? So do you, do you do your own nutrition? Do you follow anything specific nutrition-wise? Uh, I do my own nutrition. When I dropped weight class from 63 to 57, I had a nutrition student at my university slash my very, very good friend, Joe Sadler. Um, he has come to pretty much. He's, I know, shout out. Um, he's not actually a nutritionist anymore. Like he just, he did his second year of uni and then he, he decided it wasn't for him. However, he was extremely helpful. Um, drop, make helping me to drop weight and maintain strength, and I, I was able to drop weight quite easily because I definitely wasn't in my right weight class. I was always super light, finding it really difficult to fill the weight class and stuff. Yeah. Um. So ultimately, I I guess you could say I've got a if it fits your macros type yeah. deal. That doesn't mean I eat mackies and donuts or anything like that. I still eat pretty clean. Yeah. I guess you can call it if that's what people call clean eating i eat a lot i'm a big foodie yeah i i i eat a lot i've been up to the 3000 calorie mark numerous times and yeah i just eat a lot i've always had a big appetite since i was a child so and do you do you, do you cut do you cut weight what do you walk around that normally so it's recently changed since sweden but previously to sweden i walked around about 58.3 ish Okay. The past year, I've been able to get that up to 59, 59.2 on average, um, which I found has been beneficial. Um, so I do cut a little bit of weight and I find that really easy to do because I eat so much. So it's so easy to just drop it down. Yeah, um, I was going to say, if you're hitting 2,000 calories some days and you know, you're only a couple of kilo out, that can't, it's probably not a huge weight cut. Do you, no. I don't, 3, 000, that's 3,000 calories. Sorry, I, I can go up to three. You said three. Oh man, yeah. okay, so that exaggerates my point even more. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, oh wow, okay, yeah, fine. So that makes sense. So, do, I mean, I imagine you don't even have to water cut. Um, no, however, I did, tr I don't do like a really big water cut or anything like that. I basically just reduce water a little bit. And my theory behind this is I want to, when I compete, I want to be as close to my training weight as possible. By reducing some water means you can replenish it and get up to your weight a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, whereas if it's just from calorie reduction, a nutritionist might be listening to this and be like, she's chatting rubbish. However, <laughs> this is kind of my theory. We're my co lifting close to what <laughs> <laughs> um but just from my own personal experience my own knowledge talking to nutritionists talking to other athletes etc looking at what other athletes have done etc etc i've just was like right it makes sense if i want to if i'm peaking and i'm at that kind of 58.5 mark at that point surely when i'm lifting i want when i'm competing i want to be on that stage of that similar weight and what was happening was i'd be dropping down to 56 kilos but still eating 2,500 calories the day before. So I've got nothing to put on, but I'm already two kilos under where I was training. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, so that means yeah. when, I get, when I get to the platform, I'm only 56.5 because I've had nothing to put on. Yeah. So that was, that's kind of my theory the past 12 months, what I've been playing around with. And that's what I did the first time I trialed it properly was at Nationals Just Gone. 
um, and it worked. So yeah, well, it seems to be working for you, and, and there is no one size fits all. I am actually a nutritionist. I do clinical nutrition, and there is no one size fits all. I mean, personally, I had some some health issues that I was trying to get on top of. So I actually done something that is thought of as actually not beneficial to strength sport, and I cut all my carbs out and went completely completely ketogenic. Like, okay. Absolutely strict. And actually, my lifts went up 10, 15% within two, three weeks. Because it's, it's not, you know, everyone's like, you need to fuel yourself with carbs, carbs, carbs. Yeah, I agree, carbs help. And they're, you know, you need that glycogen to, to push, you know, to get that explosive force sometimes. But actually, because I had some particular health challenges, it was, I felt shit eating a lot of carbs. So actually, I'm going into sessions feeling like shit like feeling tired, feeling really rough. So I thought, no, I've got to get on top of the health problem. So if I go and ketogenic, actually gave me a lot more energy. I felt 10 times better. Hence, I can lift better because I've got more, more application in the gym. Yeah. So actually, there isn't a one-size-fits-all. I probably will find at some point that I'm still keto, but being keto is not quite right for me at some certain stage. But you have to run, you know, you have to kind of, go with where your body's at at that point and with what you feel. So, you know, for some nutritionists to tell you, oh, this isn't working for you is, is obviously complete horseshit because <laughs> something is working. You will decide being a young athlete as well and you will find something else to tweak at some point. That's just, that's just the way it oh, is. Of course, of course, yeah. You're always learning, right? So, yeah. um, you know, you'll find, you find something that you feel is working right now, then you'll tweak something else and eventually you'll, you'll come up with a formula that's, 98 percent right and then you keep tweaking you know we're always learning and some, some yeah of course this stuff is always coming out do you do you have any supplements uh vitamins anything like that that, that helped you or you um need that they help you not at the minute no um i have creatine i guess that's the only supplement um i have the reason why i started taking creatine is because about uh about 18 months ago i was vegan for two years ah, really? um and basically i kind of uh, obviously i wasn't having red meat and i was talking to my nutritionist and he was very good actually it's my, nutri- my friend technically who was acting as my nutritionist yeah. um and he i asked him what do you think about this and we looked at the research regarding you know if you're vegan you're not having red meat it's not coming naturally into your diet it could be beneficial etc yeah. etc et um so i did start taking that but then gradually over time i realized veganism wasn't wasn't for myself yeah. um and i started eating meat again etc but i still have the creatine um as well just because i've been doing it now for a while so yeah. do you think, do, do, i mean do you think it's psychosomatic or do you think it helps you do you generally think it helps um there's definitely been times where i was like actually i can feel the benefits mainly within the session i could repeat the same hard set again and again and my recovery was a bit was a bit better but mainly between sets which ultimately is that's kind of what creatine is for yeah absolutely. From, what, from what i understand do you, um, um I, do you take monohydrate creatine monohydrate that is correct yes and you take it pre pre-workout no i take it post-workout okay you take it post yeah because some yeah. so much con you know contradiction that there's some like it pre I, like yeah that. yeah i've heard this I, i've considered taking it as an intro workout yeah I, um, I've, done, I've experimented with all three personally pre intra and post um i mean it's so hard these things are so margin personally i quite like to just bang it in pre-workout um, it makes sense it makes sense yeah and then actually i've also been through stages where i'll, I'll go up to 10 grams and i'll do um five grams pre and five grams post you know like as long as you're within a tolerance range and you're not running to the toilet halfway through, you know, there's, you, you're okay. There's a lot of a good research and creatine for benefits for, for heart health and other things anyway. So yeah, quite good to experiment with these things. So, I mean, I personally am on 95 grams at the moment pre-workout, but I've been considering putting up to 10 myself and just to see if that works for me again. But obviously it works for you and um, even sometimes it's perceived, but, you know, these things are... They're all, they're all good, right? They're all good. They're yeah. all good the percentiles. Um, so, Bobby, I'm going to start wrapping it up. You've been really good guest. I've got some really, really good, some really good nuggets from you, and you come across really well. And uh, I like 
what you do in a sport. I love what you've achieved on the platform so far. And I know you're going to achieve a lot, lot more. Now, one thing I wanted to cross before we leave, I heard you had a goal of getting powerlifting into schools. Is that right? Is that still a thing? Um, yeah, it is sort of. Hence uh, the supply teaching. That, you know, hence that kind of, yeah, I have considered it for sure. Okay. Okay. So that would be, I mean, that would be amazing because I think it's one of the fastest growing sports out there. And, yeah. you know, people like yourself and, you know, people, young, upcoming athletes that we need social media at the moment in this sport. Um, and it's a really good, powerful tool for us. And, you know, like people like yourself are making the sport bigger and inspiring others. And do you know what? Just, I, I'm a big fan. And just continue to keep doing what you're doing because you're achieving amazing things and keep going in that direction. And you're going to continue to achieve even more amazing things. So I've absolutely loved having you on. Um, where can people find you, Bobby, if they want to find out more about you? Do you do, do, you do any coaching or anything? I do, yeah. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I guess the easiest is probably Instagram. I don't have uh, my business um, up and running uh, on Instagram just yet. Um, but my name on Instagram is bobby.butters. Very simple. Easy. Um, you can figure out. What I'll do, um, Bobby, what I'll do is I'll put it on the show notes um, below your Instagram handle so people can find you. But um, you. it's been great having you on. Um, guys, check her out, Bobby Butters, Bobby.butters on Instagram, right? There you yeah. go, yeah. <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you on, and I look forward to seeing you back on the platform. Thank you, and thank you so much um, for inviting me on. It's been really cool um, doing this, so thank you. Pleasure. What we do after you have, um, after you do the next world or next British, whatever's next, we just don't know. Um, Who knows? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll, 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 I'll definitely have you on again. Amazing, amazing. Well, I look forward to it. Thank you very much. All right, Bobby. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye.